Hello, I'm Allison Thorpe, and this is God Talk, recorded and produced in the bluegrass state of Kentucky, the home of horses, hills, hiking, hillbillies, big trucks, wildcat basketball, and Daniel Boone, the state where guns are honored and shoes are optional. This is the show where science, faith, and culture are discussed openly. Welcome to God Talk a show where a rocket scientist and a medical doctor, who is also my pastor, talk about science and religion. I'm your host, Doug Thorpe, and with me as always is my co-host, Dr. Andy White. Today on God Talk, we'll continue our conversation with Dr. Paul Meyer. This is part two of two, and we're going to talk about the reliability and truth claims of the New Testament. Dr. Andy, welcome to the show. Hey, Doug, this will be uh, another great show with Dr. Meyer, who's a scholar and a professor at uh, Western Michigan, who has 50 years' experience in, in, in research and teaching in ancient manuscripts and ancient history, and I'm really excited to hear part two. So let's get Dr. Meyer on the line and get him going in just a minute. But first, this is God Talk, where we faithfully examine science and we reasonably examine faith. And this is God Talk, the show where science, religion, and theology are mixed up, mingled, and dissected. Okay, so you want to get Dr. Meyer on the line for part two. All righty. Here we go. All right, so we're back here with Dr. Meyer for part two of uh, Ancient Church and New Testament Reliability. And Dr. Meyer, I have a question regarding the canon. Um, There are claims by skeptics and atheists abound that say, Constantine put together the Bible oh my uh, goodness, yes. 400 years after Jesus uh, lived for political reasons, and they'll say that uh, you know it's unreliable because we don't know what books ought to be in there and how they put it together. Can you talk to us a little bit about how the canon was actually developed? Yeah, sure. Let me first of all uh, uh, trash down the, the ridiculous argument. Uh, first of all, Constantine uh, died in three third. 7 A.D., and that would not be 400 years after Jesus. But anyway, yeah. that's, that's a picky little response. Sure. But let me explain. Constantine had nothing to do with the canon. Uh, a lot of this informa- misinformation comes from Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code, uh, in which he claims the Council of Nicaea, where Constantine presided, uh, decided which books should go in the Bible, and it's not at all true, not true mm-hmm. at, in, the, in the least. They decided on whether Jesus was equal in eternity with God or not, not whether he was God or not. It was a case, was he co-eternal with the Father? And then Dan Brown has the audacity to say it was only by a close vote that Jesus made God. Let me tell you the close yeah. vote. 312 to 2. <laughs> And, and not, you know, no yeah. hanging chads there. No. Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. no, the canon, the canon was pretty well uh, in general use by the 150s A.D. or even by the year 100. Hmm. Uh, the, there were three rules for canonicity. One, okay. it had to have been by an eyewitness, written by an eyewitness, or a near eyewitness. That's okay. to take care of dear Luke. Yes. who is indeed an eyewitness for the book of Acts, but he's not an eyewitness for the Gospels, okay. uh, bearing his name. Okay. Uh, second, uh, it has to be coherent, the writing does, with the rest of the Christian faith. You can't have a quadrinity or something like that, or four persons in the Godhead, or, you know, some ridiculous sure. heresy. No, that they couldn't possibly have been written then you know, for any scriptural purpose. Third, it's got to be in wide use by the early church. Okay. And those are the three basic reasons for canonicity. And uh, indeed, they've served very well. Uh, and so you have the core. And by the way, it's Eusebius, the great father mm. of church history, mm-hmm. uh, who gives us this information on the formation of the canon. Mm-hmm. I have a book on, Eus- on Eusebius, too. Uh, whereas I did an abridgment in the case of Tacitus, cause he, I'm sorry, the case of Josephus, because he wrote so much. I uh, didn't have to do that with Eusebius, because mm-hmm. he has a contained amount. In any case, he tells us in Book 3 about how the canon got put together. And indeed, 
From the start, he said the four Gospels were always the four pillars originally, and then the Book of Acts, of course, was part of that too, the Big Five. Okay. And then the whole Pauline corpus, that is the books that Paul wrote to the young churches, and then the Gospel of Peter and the Gospel of James. I should say the letter of Peter and the letter sure. of James. Yeah. And that was the core. Okay. Then later on, the other writings got added. The last two, by the way... Uh, to make the cut, you might say, were Second Peter and the Book of Revelation. Mm-hmm. And I think you can understand why the Book of Revelation might be, shall we say, barely making it. Sure. Simply because of, <laughs> just, just, just look at the Bible Belt nature. today. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And how, <laughs> the Book of Revelation has been misused sure. in terms of uh, prophesying mm-hmm. Jesus and the sign of the beast and whatever else. Sure. So, uh, <clears throat> So that and this is all done by oh my goodness, by the year two fifty essentially it's it's all in place. Uh, the whole thing. Yeah, but, so this idea yeah. that it was four hundred years later is ridiculous. First of all, we know that the gospels, the core of it, were were eyewitnesses, and most of the documents are eyewitness documents. Sure. And so I don't know why they would dare say this is hundreds of years later. That's just madness. No, and the the Muratorian canon or the initial canon, of course, was. Uh, by uh, near 100 A.D., really, or, or near... Bef- yeah, we're drawing the, Ken, yeah. no, it's in the 2nd century, second but century, it's very yeah. close. Listing there, you know, in that canon alone, you have the, the most of the books and sure. the scriptures, yeah. Okay. All right, well, I've got two questions for you. One, you mentioned the Revelation, and I've always wanted to know, how do we know for sure that John wrote or inspired or interpreted the Revelation? And two, uh, are there missing letters from Paul, you know, like the Corinthian letters, and and what do you think happened to those letters? Okay. In answer to the first, uh, we we really don't know. Uh, I'm, I, I'm sorry to give it a, sure. a, 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 a non-conservative <laughs> answer, but let me explain. Um, either the the book of Revelation was written by the Apostle John, that's the most popular view, uh, who was on the island of Patmos, you know, uh, after the Domitianic persecution forced him there. And he came back, of course, after the death of Domitian. Uh, or, but the other view is that the book was written by John the Elder in mm-hmm. the church at Ephesus. There was a prominent elder there, a presbyter named John. Yeah. And so the two famous Johns were both at Ephesus, and one could have written the book of Revelation. Now, Ordinarily, everybody, including Eusebius, would have gone with the conservative interpretation was the Apostle John. However, Bishop Dionysius of Alexandria, in Book 7 of, uh, Constanti- of Eusebius' Church History, uh, he was, he's called Dionysius the Great because he was indeed a tremendous uh, leader of the Church at time of persecution in Egypt around 250s. He was a brilliant Greek scholar, and he urges the Christian public to to acknowledge John the Elder, John the Presbyter, as the Book of Revelation's author. Why does he say that? A lot of different reasons. He says the Greek in the uh, Gospel according to John and in the Joannian letters in the New Testament is a very high uh, stylish Greek. Uh, however, the Greek in the Book of Revelation is rather rough and different. Uh, the, hmm. He says the same author just couldn't have done that. Now, I don't know my Greek that well right. so that I could make a judgment like that, but Bishop Dionysius evidently did. He also points out that the Johannian literature uh, and in the first uh, in the New Testament is anonymous, and yet the Book of Revelation gives you no doubt as to who the author is. I, John, was sitting in the cave in Patmos. I, John, yeah, did this, I, John, did that, and so forth. He, he very clearly identifies himself. Right. Now, it's possible that an author can write differently some years later and get more autobiographical, so maybe that's not a total answer, but uh, I, I certainly would have no trouble uh, in terms of uh, sharing Christian fellowship with a fellow who thanks to the book of Revelation, was written by John the Elder. Yeah, and I would want to add to that question. Um, you know, when, when they talk about the direct lineage from uh, John the Elder or John, the disciple, we don't know which John, through Papias up to Polycarp and all the way to Eusebius, we've got kind of a lineage in the ancient church. I don't know if that's for sure John the, the disciple or John the Elder. They were both disciples, but John was an apostle. I mean, I guess I want to ask you about that. What do you think? 
Well, yeah, the, the, you, the, the same with Philip. You know, the, it seems that every name has to be used twice, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Or, <laughs> By two yeah. different people, and that, that does complicate yeah. ancient history. For take the name Ananias. Yeah. Good and bad. Yeah. For the Ananias. The good, good, and bad. Antioch. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Damascus, I should say. A good man. Yeah. Ananias, the high priest. Uh, he's the one who uh, <laughs> smacked Paul on the, on the cheek, remember? Yeah, that's right. So, so I, every name's got to be used twice, and so it does complicate things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, so anyway, yeah, we're not sure sure which one, but either one would have been disciples, I guess is my All point. Right. And Paul's sure. letters. Okay, yeah. And what about Paul's yeah, letters? Yeah. yeah, well, I think there's a reference to uh, uh, Paul himself saying that I wrote you previously, and that is the famous lost letter that Paul wrote from uh, Ephesus to Corinth. And uh, if that's discovered someday, they may have to open up the canon. Sure, <laughs> <laughs> and let it in. By the way, I did I did address that problem in uh, the third book in my trilogy. You know, the most famous book is *A Skeleton in God's Closet*. Uh, that was a number one national bestseller some years ago in mm-hmm. religious fiction. And then the second book is more than a skeleton. Then the third is the Constantine Codex, in which uh, we have indeed a document discovered this is fiction of course a document discovered which begins this third treatise of theophilus uh, <laughs> yeah. second act second yeah act, yeah that's right in which uh, the <laughs> Luke, Luke picks up the pen and tells what happened to paul in rome and whatever else <laughs> sounds fascinating uh, then, yeah. there we have <laughs> there we have the church council uh, the great apostolic council of jerusalem deciding shall a canon be opened for Second acts or not? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a lot of fun. <laughs> Sounds fun. It, it's a great career. Um, we have a couple more things we want to hit on on this show. Um, I want to ask you about the Dead Sea Scrolls because um, you hear a lot of things about that and what they what they show us and what they don't. Can you describe your understanding as an ancient historian? What's really been the impact? Uh, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. How has it helped us with the reliability of the New and the Old Testament? Uh, it does help in two different ways, which I'll discuss in a second. But it does not help in terms of where Jesus learned everything he taught or and this kind of thing. You know, mm-hmm. so much fuss was made about the teacher of righteousness being the model for Jesus. No, not mm-hmm. at all. It's really oblique to Christianity itself. Okay. But it's helpful for two reasons. One, it shows the accuracy of biblical transmission, and this has put a bone in the throat of Bart Ehrman. Uh, I, I, there were two Isaiah scrolls discovered at Qumran, mm-hmm. and, and complete, complete scrolls. Hmm. And before that, the earliest Isaiah version we had was the Masoretic text from 1006 A.D., Mm. But now, here we have two complete Isaiah scrolls, 1,200 years earlier from 200 B.C. Wow. Get what I'm driving at? Absolutely. Now, let's compare now you can compare, text. see what they let's look compare like. compare the text. Yeah. 99.8% is <laughs> identical. <laughs> That's so amazing. it's only get these little things that Bart Ehrman makes such a fuss about. <laughs> They're ridiculous. So this is one way. It shows the accuracy of the, of uh, the scribe. Yeah. You know, they they had a rule that when you recopied God's Word, you better not screw up. Yeah. And so they always did scrolls in two-page segments. And if you made one mistake in the two-page area, don't reach for the bottle of whiteout. You <laughs> redid the whole thing. So they would also count from the first word to the last word and go in reverse, and if you didn't meet it at the same middle word, uh, they wouldn't accept the manuscript. So yeah. they're, they're, they're very careful, really. Yeah. And the other point, though, is this. Those who were trying to make a uh, a big case about uh, the uh, Gospel of John being written in 175 A.D., just like uh, the Tibetan people did, are now defeated by the fact that, in fact, their argument was you have opposites like the uh, war versus peace, uh, freedom versus slavery, white versus darkness, who claimed uh, that uh, these concepts were not jo- Johannine, but they were Hellenistic, hundreds of years later. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the first dis- documents they discovered over there was the War of the Sons of Light versus the Sons of Darkness. <laughs> How do you like that? <laughs> so it's a very helpful in that respect. Yeah, absolutely. 
All right. The the skeptics claim that the Gnostic Gospels describe a different Jesus and a different Christianity. Why is this not the case? Well, simply because they're way off off the, the line in terms of any <laughs> deity, in yeah. terms of any descriptions, they're totally different in that respect. Uh, and, and so that they really are not a different brand of Christianity. They're simply non-Christian. They're pagan. Sure. They're, they're uh, just like sensationalists today are trying to screw up the scriptures. So that's what they did back in those days too. We've got the truth; you don't. Let us tell you. Sure. And, and so they're, they're simply they're worthless. Really, I don't know why everybody's making such a fuss over them. It's right. ridiculous for no reason. Well, to, and they were know. written. They were written later. I mean, that's the thing. Correct? Oh, well, yeah, mean, of course. Always written later. Yes. Sure. I mean, several hundred yeah. years later. So. I mean, yeah, that's, yeah. The, that's the big thing. And they describe, you know, books like the Gospel of Thomas is what we're talking yeah, about. Gospel yeah, Gospel of Thomas yeah. and Gospel of Mary. Yes, they were written much later than the original Gospels. And, of course, they describe a very different religion. So I think it's important because you, you see that a lot on the Internet, that, 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 that the Absolutely. Christian church yeah, missed yeah, it, yeah. you know, yeah. And, of course, they're always trying to get Jesus married off. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did he get married? Yeah, that's right. Had to have a wife. Right? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was one of our questions. Yeah, is, why well, didn't Jesus get married? Yeah, well, he. there's no record that he was married. and he, No, 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 no. no. And, and you see this. He just simply wasn't. Yeah, there's no yeah. record of it. What? Uh, well, just let me, let me jump in there real quick. You know, uh, whenever I'm trying to counsel... Uh, teenagers or you know, young people going through, you know, the, the 20s, it would have been really nice if we had some sort of literature on Jesus is going through his, you know, his uh, teenage years and whatever and his troubled times. But Oh, we got all kinds of literature in that respect. Simply look at the novelist writing today. Yeah, the novels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. But we got nothing yeah. from age 12 to 30, essentially, right? No, that's right. That's right. Okay. He, uh, everything's normal at that point. He doesn't wear a halo in Galilee. Right. Kids didn't need a flash out of light. They just watched Jesus' halo go by. No, nothing like that. <laughs> no, it's all no. junk. He it's just, all junk. Yeah, he just lived a normal life, I think, is the key to that. Yeah. All right. Let me uh, end it with one more. If you could simply just give us, uh, and I, I don't want to keep you longer, but um, you also work in um, archaeology. And could you just give us a quick example of uh, in way, in some way that archaeology supports the Bible instead of contradicts it, and we'll end with that. All over the place. That would take about five hours because there's oh so many There's examples. So much. So let me just let me just give you one, okay. and that is the Pontius Pilate stone. Uh, so the critics were saying Pilate never lived, but of course he did. We have all the records from Rome as well backing him up. In 1971, they found a two by three foot inch inscription, a two by three foot stone with the following two-inch inscription in Latin goes like this. To the people of Caesarea, Pontius Pilate, the prefect of Judea, has presented the Tiberium, uh, a building in honor of the Emperor Tiberius. So flat out there you have there you him go. showing up in stone as well. And so the stones do cry out indeed. Absolutely. <laughs> Listen, we uh, really appreciate you. We hate to keep you so long. We usually try to do 45 minutes, but you are such a wealth of information. We really wanted to do two shows on it. So I appreciate well, uh, uh, you. Well, absolutely. Okay, fellas. Well, it's a fun talking to you, and a happy Thanksgiving. The same to you. Thank you. God bless. All right, bye-bye. Uh, bye God bless. Bye-bye. All right, that was Dr. Paul Meyer, and that was an absolutely excellent interview. I, it he's, was. He's a great joy. He really was. He's a good person to interview. Not only is he trustworthy as a scholar, he gave us really solid answers, but he's entertaining. He was very entertaining. He was I, fun to interview. I like the, uh, you know, I asked him the one question about the Revelation. And, yes. And I was like, who wrote this? Because it's totally different. And it, Well, totally different in, what do you mean, by the, writing? The, the writing style is totally different in from the, the Revelation versus the John, John the Gospel. John the, the Gospel. Letters. Yeah. Yes. I am glad you asked him that, Doug, because that proved to me that this guy is honest, he's trustworthy, and he's telling us the truth as a scholar. Because the the uh, fun answer he could have given us, or the conservative answer that I wanted to hear, was I wanted him to say, no, John the disciple who wrote the Gospel of John also was John of Patmos who wrote the Revelation. That's what I wanted to hear. Right. But he did not say that because he doesn't know. 
And so that shows his honesty and integrity as a scholar. It still could be. It could be that somebody else was the scribe. Right. Well, he wrote it down. I, you you mentioned that he's a scholar. He's uh he's actually a professor still. Yeah, still a professor. So, so he's got his reputation still at stake. And Absolutely. He's not, so what he said today was Absolutely. I mean, and he's written oh, I don't know, I don't want to say how many books, but a bunch of books. He's written a bunch of books and a bunch of technical papers that are peer reviewed. So a lot of this stuff is written in the literature, in the peer reviewed literature. A lot of what he said is written in his books, like his book on Eusebius and Josephus and so forth. So he's got a ton of literature out there, and he is still a sitting professor. So yes, I mean, he's he's absolutely right on. And when he gave us that answer, I could tell that he was only motivated by truth, and that's what we want the show to be. Well, absolutely. And uh, he, he yeah. blew me away. He was saying, oh, well, Jesus is real name. I thought, wait, wait a minute. Now. It's not Jesus Christ, yeah, you know? Right. <laughs> Jesus of Nazareth? Slightly different. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was like, yeah. okay. Joshua. And, yeah, and Joshua. They're, and they're worried about the... The, the 40, scribal errors. The 400,000 yeah. yeah. titles. I was like, oh, come on. <laughs> now, let's talk about that for a minute. He gave us ironclad proof. I mean, we're talking from an ancient historian now who reads ancient literature right okay so i mean that's what he does for 50 years and he's been trained at ivy league schools and in europe and everywhere else got a doctorate and he tells us that bart ehrman is just i mean bart ehrman makes money a lot of money off these books so let's be real clear he's got a reason to do that but what he says is there are all these uh variants so bart ehrman's argument is you can't trust the bible well he tells us which i didn't know Bart Ehrman comes from a biblical literalist background. He was a very conservative literalist before evangelical, before he became an atheist, or he's an agnostic, I guess. So that explains a lot, you see, because the literalists we've talked about before, they say now every single jot and tittle has to be exactly the way it says, like the earth has to be 6,000 years old, or you have to throw the whole Bible out. Well, we've we've moved past that a long time ago. Well, he gave us the uh, the other example of all the different people who saw Rome burn. Sure, and they all have a different perspective. And exactly. That's, and so, yes, we've got four guys here who's writing, you know, from different perspectives. perspectives. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's talk about that. The Gospels are um, that's a very important point. You've got the three synoptics: Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Luke was not a direct eyewitness, but he was he worked with Paul, and he was uh, he wrote Luke and the Acts, and he came along as a historian, as a doctor, right after the resurrection, and he writes these stories down, writing to Theophilus. So then you got Matthew and Mark, who were direct eyewitnesses, but they probably didn't actually write. Themselves. Well, we don't know. We know that Mark actually wrote the words of Peter. Now, we know Mark was uh, actually there, uh, you know, he, he talks about him in the Bible, but he was actually prior. we think he wrote the story from Peter, exactly, because Peter couldn't write that, and we think that Matthew probably did write his own gospel, he was a tax oh, collector, a, tax a little collector. Ed, more educated, and he probably could write it, and he was writing more to the Jews, uh, Mark was writing more to Gentiles. So, but anyway, um, they were eyewitness accounts. Luke was a, a historian, and then John was an eyewitness. Okay, but he probably didn't write. Shit. He pro- we don't know. Yeah, we probably not. I mean, he probably had somebody else write it. So we know that, uh, but we know they're all eyewitness accounts of what happened. Now, taking from that to be that ancient, that's pretty good. Now, the fact that you've got little differences in there, we would expect that. I wouldn't expect them to be the same. Well, if they were, I'm actually suspecting because it is so close. And we yeah, talk, it makes it seem real. It, well, actually, right? I was like, well, why is it so close? Why are they getting it so correct? And they and they didn't write it down for 30 years. Right. So it's kind of, you know, if I'm kind of, you know, that's what makes me more suspective that it, it yeah, is true. That yeah. it, that is not true is because it's so so identical. You know, from oh, if it were identical, yeah. yeah, if it were, that'd be collusion, right? Yeah, if they if they if they were exactly the same, that would tell it well. And see, that's the way the Quran. You know, there's only one copy of the Quran, and it's exact. Every other copy is exactly the same. You right. know that. We've got hundreds of copies of fragments of the Gospels from various different years, from ninety. 
there's some some now that are in the early first or late first century. We got second century copies. We got third century copies. We got hundreds of fragments. And when you look at any of them, they all are basically say the same thing, but they're a little bit different. So as far as the copies, we've got we've got some scribal errors that don't amount to anything from a doctrinal standpoint. And as far as the four gospels, you got four different stories of the same account. If you and I were going to write a um, a memoir twenty years from now, twenty years now, about yeah. this episode tonight, or well, we talked about this before about our very first episode. Even if we were to write that right now, our very well, first episode, yeah, and that would be six months ago, right? But I'm saying if we take it out twenty years, right? Say that, and and something memorable, because you got to think this wasn't just any day. I mean, Jesus was doing miracles and resurrected, and I mean they're going to remember these things. Uh, and like I said, even with the Sermon on the Mount, he did that several times, so they've heard that over and over. There were many other disciples, so they could put that together. But if you were, if you and I were going to do this 20 years from now and talk about a significant time, you would write one version, I would write another. Well, my guess is, and I don't know, we'd have to see, but I guess we would get the important details right. Right. But we would also say different things. You might say... Um, well, the wall was dark brown, and I might say it was tan, and you might say the ceiling fan was on, and I might say it was off. But we would all we we'd talk about the central things we talked about on the show. And then, well, you know. yeah, you're going to be talking about the fan, you know, since I'm a sound engineer for for the in, mm-hmm. for the church and whatever. Right. I would be thinking, oh, geez, you know, the sound was just about right, you know, and, and I wouldn't even comment on. You wouldn't even, you know, you know that's. Yeah, this is my yeah. This is my thing. You know, mm-hmm. is the sound to make sure the sound quality is. That's correct. right. So I blame. So everybody blame him if it's off. <laughs> yeah. But that's the point. And and you know, we would have little differences, and that you would expect that in a courtroom. If some, if you get two witnesses up, and they say the exact same thing with every single, oh, you yeah. know, then you know they got together and they colluded. And they, yeah. Okay. Rehearsed it, colluded. Yeah. So that's that's a very strong point for the Gospels being true, telling the same story, not exactly alike. Now, uh, you know, the, the thing about the women, uh, the women go to the grave to, they were actually the first eyewitnesses of the resurrection. If you would not make that up, because it, women in that day had no uh, power to testify. So, I imagine they did that. It was like, yeah, well, that's what happened. So yeah. <laughs> that's who found him. You know, I mean, they wouldn't have if they were going to make it up. They wouldn't have said the women found him, right? Because that's instant loss of credibility, right? Right. You know, things like that. I mean, there are just there well, are hundreds of things like that. Well, but, yeah. and we have a lot of skeptics that says, well, look at how many errors there are. Did the did the crow actually? Uh, uh, well, did, did the, the cock crow, crow three times, times or, or two? one, yeah, one right, time or right, whatever? Right. What is it? You know? Yeah. Well, and again, those things are... Does it make a difference? Does it make a difference? And we would expect them to get that wrong. Right. You know, those little details. I, so, anyway, this was a great interview. He's, he. I wish we could have gotten him to stay longer, but we kept him long enough, I think, for oh, a two-part yeah. show. <laughs> okay. He did a great job. So, anyway, what else? We got going on. We might want to talk just for a minute about the uh, France... We yeah, haven't we, talked about uh, current events recently. We, and, not for a while, but we've had, uh, last Friday, there was an explosion, or actually a series of explosions from radical Muslims. Uh, some of them grew up in France mm-hmm. and, and Belgium. Belgium's getting a lot of, they have actually uh, communities of Muslims. And somehow or another, you know, they they said, well, my I guess my two brothers have been radical." radicalized okay and they didn't you know the you know the, his elder brother was still at in belgium he goes i didn't know you know he's that right yeah he's been an honor student and now mm-hmm. he's a, a radical muslim and he's gone to syria uh, to fight so wow it, it's just tragic all around how can somebody take a religion no matter what it is right and radicalize it and turn it into a, a, a terrorist terrorist uh, vision of hate Right. And, and a machine of hate and, and murder. I mean, really, it's just, it's really sad. I, I want to make sure, you know, we stress the difference now between the Christian faith and Islam. Islam is a conquest religion. It's a religion of of uh, hatred. And they only hate the infidels. They're after anybody who's not like them. 
we do Christian faith is not that way. It never has been. If it ever would have been, such as in the Middle Ages, it was going against Scripture. Now, that's the difference. Right. When Islams do this, the Islamic people do this, it's consistent with the Quran. Oh, yeah. This is, that's the difference. It's definitely, you know, because the Quran was written by somebody who's trying to conquest Saudi exactly. Arabia. Exactly. And so, the, so they're consistent with their mission. Right. And uh, that just points out the radical difference between the Christian faith and the Islamic faith. But it really is. It's tragic. And the thing is, I fear that ISIS is growing uh, both in number and in severity, let me say, or seriousness. And they have targets set on the United States. And that's, you know, I've heard, I can't confirm this, but I've heard several sources that you know, we could be in for the Similar well, kind of problem. Well, and it's, it's, you know, it's the homegrown terrorist. How in the world does somebody grow up here in the United States, they have everything, and yet they want to, to kill people, you know, right. in the name of religion? Yeah. Well, it just shows the, the power of the, of the jihadist. But uh, anyway, we, we at least need to talk about that because uh, as we go, we continue to see Christians persecuted. And that's, that's really, you know, what it's about as well. We see that all over the world <clears throat> and now in Syria so much. But anyway, this was a great show. And this is God Talk, where we rightly divide the line between science and faith. And this is God Talk, where we faithfully examine science and reasonably examine faith. Thank you for listening. Please visit our website at godtalk.com. Our audio files can be found on iTunes, SoundCloud, and many other podcast platforms. You can find all of our God Talk videos by searching Dr. Andy and Doug on YouTube. Please visit our Facebook page at www.facebook.com slash Dr. Andy and Doug. Thank you for listening.